everyone and welcome to another episode of the Ultimate Supply Chain Podcast where we invite industry leaders to answer your questions and give you an in-depth insight into the world of logistics. I've really been looking forward to this one. We're going to be going up a few levels to consider key trends across the entire supply chain landscape. What those disruptive or black swan events cause in our industry, how companies should respond, and the metrics and tools we can use to effectively measure what resilience plans we have in place and how effective they are. I'm really delighted to have Professor, global speaker and author Richard Wilding with me today. Richard's a globally recognised thought leader in supply chain. He's a professor of supply chain strategy at the Cranfield School of Management, and he's the author of more than 500 published articles, books, chapters, blogs. Richard, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you very much. After that introduction, I can't wait to hear myself speak. So, I'm a bit fangirling exciting. this morning, Richard. Uh, I know yeah. we spend a lot of time with you here at Supply Chain. It's great to meet you in person. So look, before we get deep into the questions, I'm just curious to know, um, in your role as a professor in, in the world of academic supply chain, we know that supply chain has become a mainstream topic in the media. Are you seeing that impact um, via the number of people interested in supply chain studies? Yeah, I, I mean, gosh, yes. I mean, when I joined Cranfield, which is now nearly 25 years ago, if you look at our full-time master's programme, which is MSc in Logistics and Supply Chain Management, that actually had around about 30 students on it at the time. So that was, you know, uh, back then. Um, currently, we have over 250 students from around about 20 different, you know, 20 different nationalities on our particular programs and we're looking at next year and uh, which is going to be you know uh, if you like the 2022 intake as it were and we're even sort of having to forecast for around about 300 students so this is something which is absolutely massive and we found that you know in a way over the last two years something which is really important is is that because of the disruptions to supply chains supply chains have been operating quietly in the background for well, forever, for millennia, you know. I mean, you can read about early supply chains, um, you know, literally in the Bible because, you know, they describe the linkages and everything of trading routes of ancient times. Supply chains were there, but actually what's actually happening is when supply chains become disrupted or there's pressures on them, all of a sudden people notice them. And that's what we've been seeing, you know, during the pandemic, during these black swan events we've been seeing, all of a sudden, supply chains, people's lives are being impacted by them and therefore it is becoming increased focus. And that means that people really want to learn and understand what's going on with them, which I think is great because I think everybody should be doing logistics and supply chain. <laughs> Look, I completely agree. Even my mum is talking about supply chains these days and saying that if she had her time again, she would love to have, have studied supply chains and, and just the massive impact they have on the world. I think it's fair to say, you know, you touch on those black swan events there. Um, I think it's fair to say that we've had more disruption and change in the last few years than most of us can remember in the t entire rest of our lives. Can we talk about those black swan events a bit and how you feel they're shaping supply chains today and the way supply chains are going to develop in the future? Yeah, well, I mean, if, if um, you know, I often talk about the old normal. The old normal <laughs> was only a couple of years ago. 2019 was the old normal. You know, everything seems so simple and straightforward then. But what we then had was we had the pandemic kicking in and that caused all sorts of challenges, sh shortages of containers. Why? Because containers move around the world. Ports were going into lockdown. Countries were going into lockdown. That was then disrupting, if you like, uh, the movement of uh, raw materials, goods, finished goods, and so on and so forth. So all of a sudden that brought that into sharp focus. So we were managing that. But then we've had other things hit us as well. So we've had things like the Suez Canal, you know, a boat just getting stuck in the Suez Canal blocking trade again that caused further challenges but actually part of the roots of all this you know when I reflect on it is what we have to remember is is during um, you know early 2020 for the world the tide went out on demand 
right? So if you can imagine, it was a bit like a tsunami. The tide went out on demand, but all of a sudden then in 2021, as it were, demand started to return globally. And so we ended up with this tsunami wave of demand and that's caused a lot of the issues that we've currently got because, you know, uh, we were looking at what was going on in Europe. We were ending up with additional, um, you know, it was up, uh, you know, hundreds of percent increases in, you know, imports trying to get into Europe and so on and so forth. Same with the US, because all of a sudden the world came alive again and everybody wanted everything. And that then just put the existing old normal infrastructure under increased pressure and that has caused an awful lot of big issues you know we've ended up with labor shortages i um, mean lorry drivers because everybody um well there we were furloughing lorry drivers um and you know um basically they then said well fine i'm going to find something else to do and a lot of them have done it and they enjoy it more than driving lorries so they haven't come back into the industry we've had people retiring so there's been multiple things which have sort of impacted a whole raft of areas and now we've got more recent events you know the geopolitical challenges of ukraine russia um you know and just all of that is further exacerbating some of the challenges that we've got so, Richard, we've talked about those black swan events and how we've had several over the last few years. Can we talk about about the interdependencies between those and, and, and how they're linked or, or not linked? Yeah, well, I, I think it's really interesting. This is something which we're, we're really starting to find. So, for example, um, you know, we had, if you like, the big, um, if you like, the tide went out on demand. It then came, you know, the tsunami came in on demand and that put pressure on gas prices okay so gas prices started to soar what then happened was was that people who make fertilizer um they suddenly go actually gas prices this is nitrogen based fertilizers they say gas prices are rather high we're going to actually uh stop production because um you know that's going to be a good idea we can't afford to sell the fertilizer at that price problem is the byproduct of making nitrogen-based fertilizer is carbon dioxide. So all of a sudden we then found that, um, okay, we didn't have the fertilizer, but we didn't have carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is used in the meat industry, the drinks industry, the food industry. So all of a sudden we had, for example, in the United Kingdom, the government having to intervene to say they were going to prop up the, uh, the fertilizer companies in order to be able to actually make those things. What we then found was that Farmers are saying, hang on a minute, fertilizer's too expensive. We're going to change the crops we're going to grow next year, so this coming this coming season, to crops that actually need less nitrogen. So then they started switching crops away from some of the maize crops onto uh, you know, some of those other crops. So what you start to see is these parallel interactions in supply chain terms we talk about sometimes the ripple effect sometimes the it's like a macro you know, the, effect yeah you know it, it's sort of it's a bit like a, a a rock being thrown in thrown into a pond it, you know it sends ripples out across seemingly mm. disconnected supply chains so then you see things like oh we've got the chip shortage you know microchips we need more microchips why did that happen? Well, that was basically because the automotive didn't want them, but consumers wanted them. Everybody was buying tech, webcams, everything else, so we could do things like this. And what then happens is, is that we've got this chip shortage which is going on, which then gets further exacerbated because there was a drought in Korea. Now, you might say, well, why does a drought impact making microchips? Because to make microchips, you need awful lots of ultra-pure water to be able in the manufacturing process. And then on top of all that, we've had the ge geopolitical challenges of Russia and Ukraine. Russia and Ukraine, um, you know, um, vast sources for, um, for grain, crops, fertilizers, and everything else. So now we've got shortages there on top of all these other things which was taking place. And we start to see, if you like, these waves and ripples and amplification just going across the whole supply chain network. And actually, from a uh, from a uh, well, you know, from an academic perspective, 
Uh, this is something which people have studied for many years. So we, we talk about demand amplification, the Forrester effect, the bullwhip effect. These are things which uh, were first sort of like documented in 1958, you know, so there's nothing new there. My doctoral research was actually on chaos theory in supply chains. So, you know, it was actually looking at how some of the, uh, if you like, the, the equations we use for managing inventory within supply chains under certain conditions create random peaks in demand, which then start to cause parallel interactions and also the bullwhip effect. So we've got this, we, we often talk about a complex adaptive system. It's like a weather system, you know? So we, we see, you know, um, you know, that small butter, they talk about the butterfly effect, you know, a small butterfly takes off and causes a massive storm in another part of the world. And hey, that's what we've been finding an awful lot of in terms of the supply chain. So we're gonna see some big challenges. And of course, what we're all currently seeing at the moment is high inflation across everywhere because of um, you know just the fact that we've got this demand has come back. You know, at the end of the day, it's supply and demand. You know, when we haven't got the supply, demand goes up, prices go up. And that's what we're, that, that's what we're starting to see. So, Richard, we hear a lot in the media about returning to normal and getting back to normal. Is there a getting back to normal in supply chain? I honestly think that one of the things we have to recognise, and I've been saying this to companies for some time now, that if your supply chain is the same as it was in 2019, in other words, the old normal, you're doing something very wrong. Right. What we have to recognise is that it, within a supply chain, so I'm a professor of supply chain strategy, and when we start to actually reflect on that, the supply chain, now supply chain strategy is all about how we deliver value to customers. And below that, the, in simple terms, there's four key things that we have to sort of play around with, and that's the process design the infrastructure equipment, the network design, the information systems design, and also the organisational design. And the problem is, is when we set that up for what was going on in the old normal, and now we're in this new world, our supply chains no longer work in the same way. And that presents us with a big challenge. And we came up with this awful term, which is pre-new normal, which is <laughs> really what we're doing there is, is we're using our old supply chain processes, infrastructure, information systems and people for this very new way of working. And we're seeing that, you know, for example, in retail. So what's actually happening is, is what customers actually value has completely changed. You know, people would prefer to have online delivery and so on and so forth. But if we think about, say, some of the big grocery retailers, they still pick in store and then take it to your, you know, take it to your house. And that's fine when the volumes are very, very low, but now volumes have increased dramatically. So what we're now seeing is, is you know, all, all these people talking about, well, oh, our sales are up. You know, so we're getting all these companies declaring sales are up, but then, hey, look at the profits and the margin. They're right down. And that brings us into this cost to serve, because to be quite honest, many organizations are just burning money trying to serve customers in this in this way and so what we've got to do is adjust and change those processes infrastructure information systems and people to match the new ways of working and that way we can then actually you know have increased sales but also have the profits which we should have associated with them sure i'm, I'm glad you touched on a cost to serve richard um obviously it's something that in an organization like dhl supply chain it's something that we are occupied with preoccupied with and also providing value are you seeing changes to the way companies are approaching both cost and value i, I think this is really critical because um understanding you know understanding the true cost of what's actually going on. So for example, one of the big changes we've seen in recent years is, is really the strap line of, um, you know, procure for resilience rather than for cost. So what we're having to actually understand is, you know, yes, you might be able to get it cheaper, but if they're completely unreliable in your in delivery, 
ultimately that's going to cost you an awful lot more because you're going to damage your reputation. You know, people will just go elsewhere. People are willing to pay a little bit more if there is that reliability within the supply chain. And yes, value has changed. So, I mean, just taking one example, I used to always say, you know, if we're looking at, say, retail environments, if you're going to get me to go shopping, it needs to be fun. It needs to be easy and I need to feel in control. And I think that's fair enough for most people. You know, it needs to be fun. It needs to be easy. You need to be in control. Now, what actually happened was during the pandemic, another thing came into there. It needs to be fun. It needs to be easy. I need to feel in control, but I also need to feel safe. And then you sort of think what was going on that, you know, hey, we were having to go to, you know, our local shops and we'd have to queue outside and be only be let in when the traffic light was green. Um, we had one way systems and everything else. Um, it wasn't much fun. It wasn't very easy. I was completely out of control. You know, I felt because, you know, I, you know, you're stuck in a one way system around a store and you miss something <laughs> oh nightmare um and then and then i didn't feel very safe and all of a sudden people start discovering that they can sit in front of netflix um ordering their groceries online it's much more fun it's much more easy i'm in control and hey i feel safe so all of a sudden that value changed and i think that this is what's actually going on at the moment that and this is going across all the demographics. So, you know, we suddenly started to realise my, uh, you know, my, my father, who's in his 80s, he never used to do anything really online. Now he's totally into it. You know, he thinks this is great. And that's the shift we've experienced. And that therefore means that we're going to have to completely redesign what we're doing. Now, for the logistics industry, that's a bit of a challenge because, of course, you know, DHL supply chain knows this more than anybody. You're investing in infrastructure and warehouses and the, you know, the life on those. You're hoping to get 25 years out of it. Problem is, in two or three years, change has just massively happened. And that's creating a lot of pressures on all businesses because what we had, you know, the infrastructure, the equipment, the, you know, level of automation that we might have had in a facility Actually, now we need something completely different, but we might have been set up for that old way of working. So can we retrofit it in and can we act fast? Can we move fast? It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think, you know, speaking for DHL supply chain, there were always plans in place. There were always, you know, we spend a lot of um, we invest a lot in research. Um, we are trying to look ahead of the curve to see what's coming down the line, to see what innovation looks like. And I think perhaps COVID and the pandemic in some of these geopolitical circumstances have accelerated what we were going to do anyway. Um, so to a certain extent, it's exciting. To, to a certain extent, it's nice to be almost on the edge of comfortable. Um, and I think, you know, often that makes people perform at the optimum level, it makes organisations perform at the optimum level. However, what does resilience mean to our customers right now, to customers of supply chains? Are you well, seeing changes I mean, with that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting. And I, I was just playing around, actually, with, you know, uh, looking at some of, some of those definitions. So I'm, I'm just going I'm just pulling up a a, a bit, something on my screen for some academics will hit you with an academic uh, definition. So if you're looking at supply chain resilience, supply chain resilience is the adaptive capability of the supply chain to prepare for unexpected events, respond to disruptions and recover from them by maintaining continuity of operations. So this is this prepare, respond, recover. And I think that, um, you know, the, the key thing that we've we're finding is, is that um, many companies now um, are having to sort of think through, well, we need to prepare. And part of that is that is forcing us into much greater collaboration with our logistics providers. So, you know, if you're working with DHL supply chain, uh, because you guys are an integral part of, um, you know, that, that whole supply chain structure, that whole value delivery system, what you've got to totally ensure is, is that, you know, they're going to need to work with you and say, well, what preparations we've got in, uh, got in place to be able to do this? Then when a disruption occurs, how do we respond to it? You know, how, how are we able to do this as a supply chain as a whole? We have to remember that competition is not between individual companies. It's between the supply chains they are part of. 
you know and and this is something that people really need to recognize that you know i'm as, i'm only as good as my worst supplier that, that's a good way of putting it if you want to be provocative right so but then you've got to be able to recover as well and that's really important as you're actually going through that sort of, um, you know, that that recovery thing. And you've got to get those principles in place. And it's quite interesting because um, I've literally uh, hot off the press on LinkedIn Learning. I put together a, a, just a short course, you know, um, it's a number of sh just short videos, which because I totally believe this whole area should be front of mind. You know, I, I sort of sit at, uh, you know, at work, I have to do things on, uh, you know, we have, we have a whole system where I have to do all these little short courses uh, for the university to protect ourselves from risks, okay? And, and, and this is really important because I have to do them on, you know, the usual stuff like, you know, fire safety, all right? So I have to know- Data which, protection. Yeah, you know, health and safety yeah. type things and everything yeah. else. I also have to do it on data protection. You know, th that's really important as well. Um, I have to do it on like, you know, diversity, inclusivity, you know? So we have some of these other things. The reason why we do these things is because what we're trying to do is to protect the organization from risk. Because ultimately, if I'm not aware and there's a fire, you know, a health and safety issue, it could be bad for, for you know, it can be dangerous to me, my colleagues, but also the business can be held to account. Now, I would argue that sub basically supply chain risk and resilience that can be more damaging to your business, your reputation and everything else than just a, just about all those other things. So, yeah, I may be biased, but I honestly think that everybody should, it doesn't matter who you are in a company, HR, finance, whatever, you should understand the fundamentals of basically supply chain risk and resilience because it has such a massive impact. And if I'm in HR, a decision I make will ultimately impact on the risk profile of the supply chain, as can finance. You know, they will make decisions which will give direction to the business and that will have an impact on the risk profile of the supply chain. Of course, operations, procurements and all these other people. So, you know, I, you know, I put this little course together on LinkedIn and, um, you know, it's really in, it's a really interesting. So I just urge people, look, you know, shouldn't this be something that we're looking at once a year? I have to do my fire extinguisher health and safety training every year to just get it front of mind, front of mind. And I'd argue exactly the same is the case with some of the things in the supply chain now. And I think the last two, two, three years have really demonstrated that. And, and I think, you know, that the to a certain extent, if there's anything that's good that's come out of the pandemic, it is raising the profile of the importance of the supply chain and resilience within it. You're absolutely right. I think there are parts of organisations that almost fail to realise that they do impact directly on the resilience of a supply chain and, and the, the potential impact that resilience has on a business. So look, you, you've written about the, the main pillars of supply chains, you're well known for it around agil agility, collaboration, culture. You mentioned collaboration a minute ago and it's something I wanted to pick up on because we are seeing a lot of that with our customers. I think you're right. The relationship between supply chain providers and customers is changing. We see a, a far greater demand now for collaboration in that relationship rather than a kind of order taker relationship. And it's interesting, um, firstly, because they're asking for it. And secondly, this is what I want to get to, that demands a different culture. Mm. So, I mean, culture is not something that is the most obvious pillar when you're talking about supply chains. Can you talk a bit about that, Richard? How are you seeing different cultures develop as a result of the changes we've seen in supply chains? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the definitions which I like to use, which my, you know, my, my colleagues who are specialists in this area would argue with, but I just it works for me, and I think it works for supply chain people, is culture is what people do in the absence of instruction when they're under a bit of pressure. So how does your business actually act when, it's, when there's nobody telling you what to do and you're under a tiny bit of pressure. And that sort of typifies the type of culture. But from a, a supply chain risk management culture, you need that perspective that when people make a decision, you know, oh, I'm going to procure from India rather than China. 
The question you need to ask is how is that going to impact the risk profile of the supply chain? You know, you just need to ask that question. So, you know, um, how will it impact the risk, risk profile of the supply chain? How is it going to also impact on, um, you know, on, you know, both upstream and downstream within the supply chain and also my business? And it's having that sort of front of mind. So it's it's getting within the organization uh, just a way of thinking and i think we've seen that we've seen some really good cultural changes you know over the years over my career i mean you know if you go back 30 years the big thing was all about quality can you remember you'd have the quality department and you'd have the quality um you know they you know all, all these things you'd have people who are specialists in quality and some businesses still do but the point is quality was everybody's responsibility and now, you know, you don't see those departments anymore because everybody knows it's sort of part of the culture that we have to think about quality. And I would argue that from a supply chain perspective, supply chain risk and resilience needs to be part of the culture of the business. It needs to be something that is business as usual. It's not some afterthought that we that we go, go about. And I think what, what's interesting is, is that we now have, if you like, techniques and frameworks to be able to really enable that. Uh, I've been having a bit of an office clean out recently and I, I found in my office some of the reports which I was doing back in the early noughties on um on basically supply chain risk and resilience and they're still very very, very topical and and relevant but uh, one of the things that I was looking at then was that uh, you know I was going through them and you suddenly realize now we've got standards uh, you know international standards like uh, BS 31000 which is a risk management standard these things are great because they give people frameworks to sort of understand and they get, they give you frameworks little checklists and so on and so forth so you can get started with it if we're thinking about relationships and collaboration there's iso 44001 it's all about business relationships collaborative business relationships and it gives us if you like frameworks to actually get started and when we're coming into the realms of collaboration i get quite passionate about this is that it, a definition of supply chain management is supply chain management is about the management of relationships with all stakeholders to increase value for the for the end customer, but reduce cost for everybody. OK, so it's all about managing relationships. But the problem is most businesses don't even manage them. They seem to think it sort of happens by accident and things like that. If you're going to manage something, you know, we're great at managing inventory. We have performance indicators for inventory. We'll have resource for inv inventory. We'll even have infrastructure to store inventory and so on and so forth. And people dedicated to thinking about inventory. Guess what? You need exactly the same for relationships. You've got to have people who are dedicated. You've got to have resource to help manage it. But you also need the skills. You know, these are different skills and this is where, you know, education, development, training and everything else comes in that you need to make sure that people have an awareness and the skill sets to be able to do that. Because generally what we will do is we will develop people's technical skill sets, you know, how, how, how to install automation, warehouse, how to do this, how to do that. But hey, that's the, if you like, the supply chain IQ. What we need is the supply chain eq the relational intelligence and that i'd argue is the actual winner if you can get that right that is actually nowadays more important than anything and it also has a big impact on resilience so so richard let's have a think about the supply chain professional of the future how different are they to the supply chain professional that's emerging today and the supply chain professional say 10 years ago well, I, I think it is very much uh, looking at different levels. So, you know, if I'm looking at, you know, we have people who are working in in warehouses and these are really professional people. You know, even a picker, the skill set that a picker needs nowadays is very different than it was a few years ago. And, and this is, you know, this is a really valuable skill set. But what we're starting to see, I mean, just just as an example, I was working with one leading retailer. They had, um, you know, they've got one particular warehouse and um, 250 people working in that particular facility. You know, it's it's quite a manual warehouse, particular skill sets there for actually operating in there. What they've also done is they've bought, built a similar facility, but this is more highly automated. 
that warehouse actually only employs 10 people. What was really interesting, though, was the um, the wage bill for the two warehouses. So you think, ha, 250 versus 10. You know, this will be massive savings. Actually, the overall wage bill was only around about 5% because those 10 people, they're, they're more or less systems engineers um, and are highly qualified in a different way. So it really does depend on what, what, what's going on. But we're, we're always going to have, for certain types of items, we will still have those very manual based facilities you know um, that will be something which will be there but we are starting to see this very different skill set because if you're moving into heavy levels of automation um, you know everybody's going oh this is great you know it's going to increase productivity yes it'll increase productivity but you're going to have fewer really highly paid people involved with it so I think that this is where you know what are the skills of the sky, uh, supply chain professional Yes, the technical skills are going to change quite dramatically um, as we as we progress. So we're going to see Industry 4.0 type, you know, it, 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 stuff coming in. You know, we need to all be aware of, um, you know, just uh, automation. We need to think through, you know, uh, big data analytics. You know, we need to be fully aware of cybersecurity and all these particular things. You're going to have specialists in those areas. But also what we're going to find is, is that, you know, for the supply chains of the future, we still need to manage uh, manage relationships. You know, we still need to manage relationships. People have been striving for years to get rid of people. You know, um, but uh, hey, we need them. We need, but we need that skill set. Um, I, I mean, I was doing some work um, across with Asia on um, uh, robot process automation, which sounds very RPA. Basically, in its simplest terms, it's, you know, you might have two spreadsheets and you have to take data from one spreadsheet to another sp spreadsheet. Well, hey, you can do a little macro, you know, it's a little computer program which just automates that. And one of the key things with that is what you're trying to do is to take the robot out of the person. So if I'm doing a job and I'm doing the same job every single day, actually, can we automate it? Can we apply RPA to that? So, you know, if there are though, you know, I, I remember, you know, a number of years ago, my son, you know, his first little, you know, sort of uh, job in the supply chain, he was working for a company and they said, right, what happens is you get this big spreadsheet comes from this big supermarket. It's got all the orders on it. What you have to do is you have to take all the data from that and plug it into this spreadsheet on our computer and deal with it. Now, he'd, he'd spent it, well, you know, we were telling him as parents, get off your computer. But what he'd actually been doing was, was learning how to program. And he came back, I remember on his first day, where he comes back and says, oh, I did this. And then he comes back on the second day and then he said, yeah, I did the same. He says, I could do a program which would sort all that out. So I said, well, why don't you suggest it to him? So he went in into the office and he says, I can write a program for this. And they said, that sounds really good. So as you're doing this as part of your vacation training, um, it will give you three weeks to do it. Well, cut long story short, within three hours, he'd set up a program to do it. They didn't believe it. Um, and said, can you run the two in parallel? After three days, um, they basically went, yeah, fine, just let it go. And then he spent the rest of his vacation going around the company uh, doing the same thing. And I think that that's the other skill set that we're going to start to see is that, you know, how can we take the, ro take the robot out of the human so the human can start actually having time to make really informed decisions and do the stuff that we're really clever at? Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, ro robotics, some people see that as a threat, but I think it actually improves the quality of the work that, that people do. We have to see it as a collaborative process. Collaborative robotics is a term that we use quite a lot. Um, but genuinely, I think it can enhance people's performance, enhance the quality of the roles that they get to undertake. Um, I mean, I, picking up on that, I mean, I do think, you know, some of the language we're using, so we talk about artificial intelligence, you know, it's dead, sc dead scary. If you think about AI, actually, a better way is to talk about augmented intelligence, you know, so mm. just changing a few words here and there, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, allow, you know, the, the bottom line is, is still people can make some of the best decisions on certain things. But if you're having to make the same decision over and over and over again, then, hey, let a computer do it. I mean, that, that that's what they're good at. But as people, we if you know, if it's these complex, messy 
uh, sort of problems that are actually going, then we're able to actually make some really interesting, uh, you know, much more informed decisions and much more insightful decisions than any computer can. Yeah, and and often when you get to the stage of differentiation between organisations, it's the people that are that point of difference. It's quite easy to copy um, what a computer can generate or, or what you can automate, but the skills that come up with the automation, the design of that automation, the people behind those skills, those are the real point of difference that, that we really applaud within the supply chain these days. And, and, and as you said a moment ago, suddenly with people talking about supply chains, the people who are involved in the supply chain, whether it's picking and packing or other warehouse um, roles or drivers, those are the ones that we applaud in a crisis because those are the ones that keep the world moving. Yeah, and these are, you know, we were talking about the hidden heroes. I mean, I remember, you know, before I accidentally fell into academia, um, I used to work in, well, I used to make bricks, basically, you know, for building houses and things like that. And, you know, one of the key things was we had one guy who used to sweep the plant. Now, if you're making bricks, you have, well, dust, you know, you think you have you think you have a dust problem, you end up with dust, you know, centimetres thick within a few days if you're not careful in those ty- in those types of facilities. But this guy was just dedicated to sweeping, you know, just keeping um, all that down. And actually, you know, uh, it's like one of the things which really struck me is that individual was probably one of the most important people in my facility. Why? Because if he wasn't there then that whole facility would grind to a halt within a few days. You know, it was as simple as that. So, you know, having this appreciation of what, um, you know, all our colleagues do is just so important. You know, it's not that one person's better than another. It's just that some people have like different roles that they're actually playing playing out. It is very much a team effort. And it's those hidden heroes of the supply chain that over the last few years we have just come into their own and you know they just need to be recognized you know hey i hey i'm a professor but you know it's like well you know probably probably you know if i disappeared the world isn't going to stop um but uh you know some of these people it, it's going to stop but what i do hope i can do is just spread the word for how important supply chain is and give you know uh business leaders that you know that vision so they can innovate and keep on improving Richard thank you Um, we have reached the end of our journey for this episode I hope you found it interesting to to hear Richard's insights and to hear some of his predictions and thoughts for the future I certainly have please tune in for the next one of our podcasts the next one is going to be on returns which is one of those features that we've seen emerge as the result of all of the changes that have taken place over the last couple of years it's a fascinating subject it's something that affects all of us in our day-to-day lives so i look forward to welcoming you next time please make sure that you you follow us that you subscribe so you never miss one of our episodes. The podcast is available, as you know, on Spotify, on Amazon Music, through Apple Podcasts and on YouTube. Leave us a review. Let us know what you'd like us to to focus on next time. Thanks so much for joining us. 